live on a given Monday morning. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Hawaii broadcasting out of Honolulu, but we have people from other places too this morning. This is the Middle Way uh, featuring Russell Liu and uh, Chang Wang. Uh, Russell is here in Honolulu and uh, Chang is uh, in, Mi in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We have a special guest for a special show about the special spring festival, and that's Dave Larson. So first, Russell, I'd like you to introduce uh, uh, Chang, and then Chang can introduce Dave Larson. What do you think? Go Great. Uh, good morning, Jay. Aloha. Welcome, everybody. And I want to first introduce Chang Wang. Chang is a, a lawyer, um, and he is in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and he is a first-generation Chinese. Uh, and then uh, he also teaches law. He's a professor of law. Then we have uh, Professor David Larson, who is uh, a world-renowned expert uh, uh, law professor on dispute resolution. And he's famous because he's actively involved with the American Bar Association, but he also hails from Minnesota, and he's in St. Paul, Minnesota. So these are our, our two guests here, Jay, uh, from Minneapolis, Minnesota, where I think it's really cold there now. <laughs> <laughs> sure it is. So uh, welcome to the show, uh, uh, Chang, and also David, uh, and Russell, of course. Thank you for being here. Uh, we're going to celebrate the Spring Festival today in our own way. Uh, so Chang, can you, can you give us the scope of the show as you see it? Uh, what are we going to do here today in the middle way? Yes, three days we will be uh, say goodbye to the year of the mouse or the year of the rat and entering the year of the ox. The Spring Festival or the Chinese New Year will be on Thursday. The Chinese New Year is the biggest holiday in Chinese culture, and not only in mainland China, but also in the historically uh, heavily influenced by Chinese culture, those regions and uh, countries like uh, Korea, Vietnam, uh, and other regions, uh, Philippines, uh, Myanmar as well. This year, we very much look forward to this year because this year, uh, we had a not very good year in the year of the mouse. But uh, all of us, Professor Larson and Russell and I, are very much look forward to the year of the ox. And also this spring festival is means allowed to each one of us. So today, I'd like to suggest each one of us, Professor Larson as a Minnesotan with heavy Chinese connection, Russell as a third generation or fourth generation Chinese American, and I as a fourth generation transplant Chinese Minnesotan to share with you and our audience what Spring Festival mean to each one of us. And perhaps we can review the past year and make some predictions, hopefully optimistic, about the upcoming year of Ox. Okay, we'll do it in two rotations. Uh, one is, what, what, do you, you know, what do you think about the, uh, the year of the Ox and, and uh, the, the transition to the year of the Ox? And then it will go around again a little later and we'll talk about your prediction. Uh, David Larson, um, why don't you go first and explain a little bit about the connection between uh, alternative dispute resolution in China. How does that connect for you? <laughs> that was a lot to talk about. Um, I'll just mention first, um, for everybody in Hawaii, uh, yesterday the wind chill in the Twin Cities was at 35 degrees below zero. We did not get above zero in temperature. And in northern Minnesota, we had a wind chill of 50 degrees below zero, which if you've ever experienced that, um, it's not cold, it's pain. Um, <laughs> so I, I like the idea of, a, of celebrated a spring festival. I can't wait for spring. Um, uh, I've been working the field of online dispute resolution for decades. Um, right now, my focus is on online dispute resolution. And um, we've got a really strong connection with China right now because of China has been one of the leaders in online dispute resolution, setting up the first online court in Hangzhou. Um, and um, they've expanded to Beijing. Uh, uh, I know they've gone into other parts of China, but they've been um, very progressive in terms of implementing and designing online dispute resolution, which is something I've been doing here in the United States. I've been the system designer for the New York Unified State Court System. And we just on January 29th, that's a few days ago, uh, launched a small claims online dispute resolution platform. 
Uh, you know, before you go into, uh, you know, the main thrust of the show, let me ask you about that. It's, I've always wondered, even from way back when, um, whether you could computerize justice. And uh, online dispute resolution sounds like, you know, one step in that direction. How far is it from online dispute resolution, such, such as you are you know, establishing now, uh, to online dispute resolution, which is run by AI, where all the rules are written down and all the mm, evidence is evaluated automatically. Are we, are we on that path, David? Yeah, yeah, well, okay, a couple of things. One, the, kind of the, the, one of the motivations for online dispute resolution right now is increasing access to justice. Um, there's a lot of reasons why people don't appear in court, and it can be because they don't have childcare, they don't have vacation days, they're afraid, they're intimidated by the other party. Um, so one thing you can do with online dispute resolution is have an uh, asynchronous platform that allows people to log on from their home or from their car or whatever is convenient. Um, and people can participate in justice in ways they have never been able to before. And the first thing we worked on in New York was credit card debt collection, where the default rate is up in the 90 percentiles. And the whole goal was try to get people engaged more with the court system and get past that, that terribly high default rate. So in the short term, we're just thinking about making it more convenient and accessible for people, and including people with disabilities. Um, will, will the day come where we have robot judges? Well, we, we might. Um, I think that we have to be very careful about that because you know, there's this kind of expression of garbage in, garbage out. Um, you're, if you're gonna be using some kind of algorithm system, uh, a lot's gonna depend upon the data that you're putting in. And if you're using machine learning, which basically learns from all the things that it, it interacts with previously, um, if you have biases built into all that data coming in, those biases are just gonna be perpetuated. So I think you can do a lot of things with artificial intelligence, but you have to be very vigilant to make certain that you're not repeating some of the mistakes, mistakes we've made in the past. Very interesting. And I, I hope you can come back and, and do a full show on that very subject. That's fascinating. Okay, but let's move on to, uh, you know, your impressions of the Spring Festival. What does it mean to you? Well, I think like billions of people, it's not an exaggeration. Um, it's like, Thank God we're moving on of the year. Yeah, the rat was a terrible year. And my understanding is your ox, the ox stands for more stability. Um, you know, and, and I'm really looking forward from, I'm with a combination of political unrest in the United States, um, very destabilizing, um, certainly with the, with the pandemic, very destabilizing. I'm really looking forward to a year where we can get on more steady, stable ground. What role does it play in the larger, you know, Chinese landscape? I mean, it's, it's, is it, it's paying homage to what? To the Chinese culture, I guess? Maybe there's some ancient um, thread of, of Buddhism. Um, and certainly it's, it's paying homage to, um, it's paying homage to taking some time off. So it's, it's, it's very popular. Uh, what, what does it mean? What, what does it mean in the landscape? Is, uh, is this something that the government wants to see perpetuated? Well, my understanding, it's a period of kind of rebirth and looking forward. Um, you know, it's a, at least a week long festival, maybe longer than that, up to 15 days. Um, it's a period of time where there's a traditional reunion. That's why it's the largest travel day of the year. Um, got, and I don't know what's going to happen this year with, um, with COVID-19. Uh, what, what the impact will be on travel. I mentioned uh, there was an article in today's paper I think it was the Times indicating that the government was slowing it down, discouraging people uh, from taking the time off. And I, I guess that's all about COVID and the variants and what have you. Yeah, so people I, are very concerned about that in China. They don't like it at all. Well, I hope so. And I hope people remain concerned here because we certainly are past it. But, um, you know, there's reunion dinners. Um, so you get together with your family. Um, you know, you, you, you clean your house. Uh, you kind of organize your life. Um, I think it's a period generally of optimism. It's a period where you're kind of washing away the bad and you're trying to attract the good. I have my little red panda tie on today. Um, <laughs> yes, I'm wearing red because I want to attract the good luck and bring it into the year of the ox. So I, I think generally it's a period of optimism, a period of rebirth. I think that actually going into last year, the year of the rat, there was some 
negative anticipation. There were people predicting it was not going to be a great year. Um, uh, there's more optimism for the year of the ox. I think there's even going to be more in 2022 for the year of the tiger. Uh, but I think we're on a really good track. Good. Okay, Russell, how about you? What does it mean to you, uh, you know, uh, uh, whose family has lived in, uh, in Hawaii and the U.S. for <laughs> multiple generations? Uh, and Hawaii certainly has a lot of activity or has had a lot, a lot of activity in Chinatown every year at, at the New Year festival but what about you jay that's a really good question because from my perspective you know i'm, I'm three four generations american chinese here um you know growing up in the cultural realm here um chinese new year meant that you would clean your room before the new year and the new year you can't actually take a broom and sweep it you have to do it before the new year and so it's really washing away the spirits the bad things i think what david has mentioned uh and i think i think in a greater context what i think you know after being in china for 20 years it's also um the, the chinese celebrated because they're more of a culture civilization state where <clears throat> culture holds them together um that culture means that uh everybody uh, looks at this as something, um, again, that has lasted on for thousands of years. You know, the first recorded Chinese New Year was in the 1400 BC. I think it was the Shang Dynasty in a place called Anyang, which I had visited, um, and where they wrote and recorded the New Year's on, uh, on uh, a cattle bone, okay? And, you know, it's, so it's a long history. Uh, thousands of years. And so, again, mix that in with uh, what David has mentioned. Uh, it's, it's cleaning out, looking forward to New Year. It's a, another year in this, in this, um, in this rite of passage that, that continues on. Okay, and uh, uh, Chang, you, you know, you, you still have uh, family connections in China. Um, you haven't left it that long ago. Uh, so maybe it, the, the Chinese New Year's festival means something nostalgic to you. Tell us how your experience is. Okay, I don't know exactly where I should start because Spring Festival means uh, so much to uh, Chinese, particularly for the first generation Chinese. So let's start with um, a historical background or the philosophical discussion of what exactly means Spring Festival. Uh, on the lunar calendar, uh, as uh, Russell said, the three festivals have been recorded hundred years ago, basically on the lunar calendar, the lunar calendar rotates on a 60 year cycles based on 12 animals. And you heard of that uh, zodiac, 12 animals and the five fundamental elements of the universe. The five fundamental elements of the universe according to traditional Chinese philosophers were gold or metal, wood, water, fire and earth. Then you have 12 animals multiplied by five elements. You have 60, right? The number 60. So in the traditional Chinese lunar calendar, the uh, 60 years is a full cycle. It keep rotating. So last year was the year of the rat, but uh, on the 60 years rotation, it was Xinchou, the year of, no, Gengzi, the year of the Gengzi. Gengzi was a terrible year on the lunar calendar. So think about it, 1840. The Opium War the, between the British and Chinese, and the Chinese lost. 1900, the Boston Rebellion, and uh, the Boston Rebellion in the late Qing Dynasty killed many Western diplomats. Then the Western Eight Country Alliance invaded Peking, uh, killed many boxers. Then there was a treaty, a surrender treaty signed by China, uh, between China and the Western Eight uh, Countries. In 1960, Another year of Gengzi, the Great Famine. The Great Famine, third, the total Great Famine from 59 to 61, uh, approximately millions, millions of people uh, uh, died of hunger. So that was uh, not a very good year. So 2020 was uh, well expected, was not a good year. This year and last year, the driving force. Uh, in Chinese philosophy, yin yang, the ne positive and negative force. Last year driving force was yang. Yang means fast, active, and ever changing. So it was a dramatic year. Everybody never happened before uh, in history. Every single human being's life on its planet was in, 
was somehow affected, affected by this, what happened to the COVID-19. So this year is associated with yin, the negative force, which is a soft, passive, and moderate. So we should expect some, uh, something good is going to happen this year. Nothing dramatic, but we are on the right path of recovery. So the, in the year of uh, ox, or associated with uh, uh, gold, gold ox, we should begin to see some level of normalcy returns, some reason and decency returns, and American returns to a land of possibilities. So that is a whole picture. To me and my family personally, the year, as Professor Larson mentioned, uh, the Spring Festival is the biggest Chinese holiday. And Professor Larson and Russell, you can celebrate up to uh, two weeks. I'm going to celebrate up to three weeks. Why? Because seven days before the new year was the mini Spring Festival. And then two weeks after the Spring Festival is the Lantern Festival. So this whole three weeks, we are in a celebratory mood. So we are going to celebrate every single day. But the most important celebrate, uh, celebration definitely is on New Year's Eve. It's not the New Year itself, not Thursday, but Wednesday afternoon to Wednesday morning, uh, Wednesday evening. If that was a New Year's Eve. Uh, traditionally, all members of Chinese family, uh, entire family, and including extended family, would sit, sit together around a uh, dining table, and then everybody is going to work together, wrap dumplings, the uh, dumplings jiaozi, together, and then boil the, the dumpling and eat the dumpling together. Unfortunately, for the past 20 years I've been in the United States, I rarely had the opportunity to sit down with my parents and my extended families to wrap dumplings to celebrate the new year. But this year, we will, my wife and I will still make a lot of dumplings for ourselves and for our Chinese dogs. Very interesting, very cultural, very family, very family. But uh, David Larson, what, you know, what about the travel? We hear that the Chinese New Year is a time for travel, and uh, people have the ability to go for two weeks uh, without having to work with three. Um, they traditionally, to my understanding, they do a lot of traveling all around the world. Um, is that still happening? Yeah, I think it's gonna be a really frustrating year um, because uh, it's such an important holiday and it's such a strong tradition. Um, not being able to travel, I think is going to, going to take a lot of the joy away from a number of people. One good thing, however, is that, you know, in 2021, we have technology in ways we never did before. So, um, you know, if this had happened 30 years ago, um, I think it would have been much more difficult than it is now because we can do what we're doing right here at this moment. We can have, we can get together using video conferencing um, and other technologies and uh, feel a sense of connection that we otherwise would not be able to do. So even though there are gonna be limitations on physical travel, um, fortunately, in the period when we're living, there are some alternatives. Yeah, I suppose, uh, you know, if you have a little, a little extra time, you could do some um, online mediation during, during the festival. Yeah. Well, or you can do some um, dumpling baking. I mean, everybody gets their ingredients, you turn on your screens, and you make the dumplings together. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for that. So uh, we were going to talk about, um, you know, where this fits in history. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Chang made it clear that it's unprecedented, and so did you. But uh, query, you know, how, how does this, how is it affected by history, and how does it affect history? Traditionally, uh, and in uh, 20, 2020, and now going into 2021. This is a historical and historical moment for both years. Um, what, what is your prediction? What's your, what's your thought about how this affects people on a, on a scale of 1.4 billion? And what is your thought about what's going to happen this year? Well, one thing, uh, you know, at least from the North American perspective, is that um, a lot of things are never going back. Um, I think employers have discovered that people can be productive working from home, that they can save money by not renting office space or building buildings. And I think that's going to be a fundamental change in how we work, that much more of our lives is going to be away from um, a communal workplace. 
Yeah, so that's, uh, okay, that's clear in the United States. It's clear in Honolulu. Russell can tell us, but is it clear in China? Um, is the same phenomenon, you know, rising up in China that we don't need these buildings? We can work for home, from home. Is that is that visible in China as well? Uh, China's uh, situation is different. China have this uh, COVID-19 totally under control. So China is already back to normal, quote unquote. Uh, people still go to office, people go to grocery store, people have uh, re all the restaurants open, school open, uh, a large party and, uh, and gathering are still you know, uh, uh, permitted, uh, uh, provided that people should be tested regularly. So uh, in terms of this North America perspective that we all go virtual online, uh, every, all the uh, conference is on Zoom right now, China is di different. So what, what that really means, we don't know yet because China is one of probably the only large economy reported uh, the significant growth in GDP in 2020. And also China is uh, leading a lot of uh, a lot of sectors and industries. So they are quite confident that you know they are uh, they are almost fully recovered, but we see the variant from South Af uh, Africa and from uh, Brazil. We don't know there will be clusters here and there, so China will not be uh, totally back to uh, normal yet. But uh, the one lesson we learned from the 2020 or the year of rat probably you can say that. It appears that uh, effective governing is very, very important. Like the, uh, some journalists already observed, this COVID-19 in 2020 uh, very uncomfortably exposed everything wrong with the American system, with our bureaucratic system, with our you know, governing, with our efficiency that, you know, hopefully this year that we will figure out how to deal with the virus because this virus will not go away immediately. It will be here with us for some years and might be some a regular thing. So, but uh, I still believe we are on the right, right track to recovery and with uh, a very competent federal uh, government and with uh, we have a very good state government in Minnesota. We believe that we will figure out how to deal with it. You know, um, as, as David said a little while ago, um, there's the bright side. Uh, we find that we don't need certain structures and institutions and we can use the technology going forward. And maybe, uh, you know, this ability, this opportunity to rethink things gives us, um, you know, a handle on solving some problems. And I, I wonder if the, and I think that's clear in the US. Um, I think it's also clear in China, but uh, David, can you give us a handle on how you think China is going to change? Uh, for example, I mean, there are issues around the government. There are issues around human rights. Um, are those things gonna change as a consequence of, uh, you know, this, this traumatic experience uh, over the, the festival and over COVID? Oh, you know, that's a, that's a very subjective kind of question. Um, I think China may be, if not unique, uh, in, a re in a small unique group of countries that ex exert a very strong hand in terms of the authoritarian nature of the government. Um, so uh, whether there's going to be any kind of dramatic change in Chinese society in the immediate future, I don't see it. Um, even though there are some earth shattering kinds of forces taking place, I just think that, that China has such a pervasive influence and touch to its population that it's gonna be very difficult to have any kind of dramatic um, societal change. Uh, so, so I guess I, I don't anticipate that. On the other hand, uh, Xi Jinping's ability to deal with COVID has been remarkable and successful. Um, uh, you know, you could say that he has enhanced and consolidated his power by virtue of his success 
Um, I think people see, just a wild guess, but people see this, this is a contribution he's made to the country, um, and they appreciate it. And they appreciate the fact that uh, it, it never got all that bad because he stepped in early uh, and took dramatic steps to, you know, curtail the, the uh, pandemic. Don't you yeah, think so that? He, he's done well, and he, he is more respected now. Yeah, so that just kind of supports my, my suspicion that we're not going to see any kind of fundamental change in any time soon. Let's Russell, just add a more. Yeah. You've uh, lived in Hawaii for a good part of your life, and but you've seen for a dozen plus years life in China. And uh, one thing about Hawaii is that the Chinese community has, has um, you know, has assimilated here more than perhaps... Uh, in any place in the country, um, and it has intermarried, and it has lived among, you know, uh, half a dozen other nationalities for as long as it's been here, and that certainly has uh, an effect of frag fragmenting its its culture points, like the, the festival. So although we see the festival taking, we have seen the festival taking place in Chinatown and, and other Chinese communities around the state, uh, it seems to me that. It is not as strong as it was perhaps, uh, you know, in the 19th century. Uh, what do you think? Is it still celebrated here? Well, Jay, that's a good question. I think it's still celebrated here, um, but it's celebrated not only by Chinese, but I think the different ethnic groups because everybody observes the different holidays together. Um, I found that there's a unifying theme in Hawaii that's very different than maybe Minnesota or maybe not, um, but there's a lot of similarity in Hawaii and China. And, you know, in Hawaii, we have the word ohana. My wife keeps mentioning ohana. She's from China. And what it means to, to Chang and David's family. And so, you know, the, 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 the cultural aspect of family still resonates. And even if it's the Chinese New Year holiday, it's, a, it's, as David said, the family gets together. And Chang said the family gets together, which is the emphasis. So I see that, you know, that holiday is still perpetuated, even though the Chinese, the local Chinese uh, uh, fourth generation are getting fewer and fewer. They're intermarrying. But there's also larger pockets of immigrants from China. And I notice they're all from Fujian now, um, I see around town. And in fact, in Chinatown, I get more vegetables grown that, I can get in China that I could not get here 10, 15 years ago. And they're all things I would eat in China. So I never miss a heartbeat. Um, but again, to answer your question, I, I think that it's still, a, the holidays are still being celebrated here because the whole concept is family. And I think that's the, what it's all about um, in, my, in my eyes. Well, let me go around and ask you, fellas, uh, one more question. And that is, uh, you know, we live in a world of change. The only thing that is certain is change itself. And I would venture to say things around the, the world are changing more now and faster now than perhaps any time in my lifetime, maybe in yours as well. And one of the things that's been unchanging is the festival. Every year, clockwork. Uh, every year, a celebration involving the whole family, just as, as tight as the Chinese culture could be. Uh, so my question to you, let's start with Chang, is where is this going? Is this changing? Is it dissipating in some way? Is it getting stronger? Um, where do you see it going in, say, 10 or 15 or 20 years? Will it be the same cultural in intensity as it has been? In the time of globalization, cultural identity is of uttermost importance. So, uh, for the good part that people can find uh, spiritual resources from their traditional culture, and on the bad part that we see also the rise of uh, white supremacy and uh, uh, populism. So nothing is permanent in, in time, and in particularly in Chinese traditional philosophy, so changes always, even in the time of globalization, and uh, the change will stay. But if there's something uh, will always be there, that is family value and, and, and cultural identity. So I just want to uh, uh, take this opportunity to, to say that, to say uh, wishing each one of you 
and all our audience a very happy and prosperous new year in the coming year of the Gold Ox, as we say in Chinese language, Gong Xi Fa Cai, wish you all enlarge your fortune, make a lot of money in the coming year. Dang, I don't want to correct you. I, I never want to correct you, but I, I have understood for many years that one says Xin Yan Kuai Le. Xin Yan Kuai Le is a uh, happy new year. Gong Xi Fa Cai is, uh, is a wish you a very prosperous year. That's a for spring festival. Yeah. Chang, okay. that's why that's in Cantonese. And the people in Cantonese always like Cantonese. think about money. <laughs> so we, well, we, we say in Mandarin as well. <laughs> Mandarin is a different pronunciation. Gong Xi Fa Cai or Gong Hei Fa Cai. David, over the past uh, few years uh, under the Trump administration, we've seen a certain amount of um, anti-Asian, anti-Chinese sentiment raised in the country. And I wonder how you think uh, that affects, uh, you know, the, the, the way that Chinese in the United States deal with this and, and for that matter, their, their celebration of festivals and the like. Uh, and, and do you think under the Biden administration, uh, we will see a, a change in that? Um, well, that's a whole nother program. Um, there's a lot we could talk about under the previous administration, but I think it was destructive in numerous different ways. And, you know, every time I heard him refer to COVID-19, as he often did, you know, it was just, I thought it was just disgusting. It was a, you know, it was, it was fostering fear. Um, it was intimidating. Um, it was separating the vice of, uh, so I, I, <laughs> I hate to say the bar is so low that we can't do worse, but I actually feel that way. We can't do worse, um, but I'm optimistic that um, President Biden is coming from a very different place and will work very hard to mend some of those fences um, and to kind of reconnect parts of our society that have really been torn apart. Yeah, there are two thoughts that come to me. The one is if you find there's a you know, um, a racist um, a sentiment in the country that, um, you know, that, that makes you not want to identify, perhaps not want to follow the cultural norms within your, within your culture. And on the other hand, it also maybe brings people together. Um, I mean, I, you know, for example, the, the, the Jews, uh, they weren't religious before the Holocaust, many of them in Europe, they became religious uh, or more religious, the consequence of the Holocaust. It brought them together. And so I, I wonder if, uh, you know, which one of those possibilities uh, you see as, as prevailing. Does racial prejudice, anti-racial uh, sen sentiment um, bring the Chinese as one group closer together, or does it make them not want to identify with cultural fest well, well, festivals and the like? You know, I think that, that, you know, part of it's your perception of whether or not there's any point to it, whether or not you can have any success. And I think the Black Lives Movement has demonstrated that, that you can affect change. Um, the Me Too movement has shown that if you, if you organize and you are active, you can affect change. So um, sometimes when you're, when you're faced with conflict, it, it does strengthen communities. And, and I think that that can happen. Um, earlier, we were talking about technology and how you can start working at home. And, um, you know, and that, that separates communities um, in very real ways. And I think there is a reaction to that. Sometimes people look for how can I attack, connect on a personal level in ways I have not been able to now that we're working apart and living apart using technology. And that drives us back to some of our holidays. And uh, I know people this year in the United States who sent Christmas cards, who never sent Christmas cards for the past 10 years, just because with the combination of the pandemic and social isolation and more technology, they're feeling um, very separated from everybody. And uh, so I think that holidays can be a, a moment in time where we step back and make a real effort to connect on a very intimate personal level. A gathering place, a gathering point. It's a lovely thought. And, and reality. Russell, is that the reality here in Honolulu? You know, I, I think it, it is a reality. Um, I think um, especially this place um, has so many different cultures. And uh, again, we celebrate 
uh, uh, different cultures. And, uh, you know, in response to your question about the Chinese New Year, will it go on? I, th I think it always will because it's like the Chinese are saying, flow like water. It's like water that goes down in a river. There's a stone. There's a big stone here, and then you pass it, and there's a small stone. So everything, water goes around it. It's like that. It will continue to flow. Uh, I'm reminded of a, of a pronunciation I never got right, Shang. And it was uh, it went something like uh, straight out Chu Chung. Have you heard that? Straight out Chu Chung. Straight out Chu Chung. Yes, exactly. The water, water will the water will find its way. It find its way. It will, and yeah. that's the optimism, Jay. That's the optimism. It's going to find its way. Uh, we have a new uh, leadership. Uh, things change, you know, and we just have to go with the flow, like they say. And it'll be all right. Thank you, Russell. Russell Liu, uh, Chang Wang, and uh, Professor David Larson, thank you so much, all of you, for joining us today and for this very enlightening discussion. Aloha and uh, uh, not only straight out to Chung, but also Xin Jin Kwai Le. Okay, may I say that? Yeah, Gong Xi Fa Tai. Gong Xi Fa Tai.